Hello everybody once again to this season Skills for All seminar. My name is Marko Valencic and I'll be the host for this year's Skills for All webinars and I'm I'm happy to be with you. First of all, I wanna I wanna present you a few housekeeping matters as well as this year's plan. So this year's plan we have seven Skills for All webinars in this season and all of them will be done on the Wednesday, most of them last Wednesday of the month, so you can be ready, you can, you can put them in the calendar. There is two different time zones, two different times that we'll do them. One is a C, one is a, one is at 13 CET, and another one is at 17 CET. This year we made two time zones in order that we can cover, we can cover the whole globe. So please, please put those in your calendar, and you will be you you will receive all the links as well later on for each individual webinar. This is an our our goal with the development department as well as the development committee was to to have the webinar starting from the ground up. So we start today with the development model for the federation. Then next time we will move to the recruitment and retention because without recruitment and retention it's hard to have a club, it's hard to have a federation. From that on we will move to the using the social media to promote the sport in the country. Then we move to the game officials because without them we cannot play games. And then later on through the season we will move through the high performance programming, national team programming and then what, how the transition from player to coach can be made. So this year we are starting from the down and then we, we are moving step by step up in, in order to, to know and to spread the message for all the, all the information that you need to build your m and to build your club. And our idea this year, it's a little bit change of the structure, <clears throat> excuse me, how we, how we will run the webinars. Last season it was more of a presentations, and this season it will be similar, but we want to have the interactive part of the webinars. We want you guys to not just be listeners, but to take active part of the webinars. And some of you maybe receive the YouTube links. Some of you maybe receive the Zoom links, but this season everybody is allowed, everybody is welcome to join us in the Zoom with the Zoom link, and there is people now watching on YouTube stream. If you, and if you want, if you wish, you can go to the IHF page, and there is a Zoom link as well. Because later on, after the main presentation of today, which is a development model in the Swedish Federation and the changes that they made. We will move to the IHF initiative. We will move to the IHF initiative that is connected to the main topic, and then after that, we will stop. We will stop streaming on YouTube, and we will have a discussion with people who join us as attendants via Zoom link. So we want you to interact with each other to get more knowledge to get more contacts and to get different ideas because we don't have all the answers in the world but but maybe all together we will be smarter and we will we will get more information and more new ideas so <clears throat> so this presentation is recorded it's streamed and it will be recorded and it will be put on the IHF page later on as well as the powerpoint presentation but but once we start with a workshop and discussion, the, the streaming will stop and the recording will stop in order that we are open and we don't have any problems or we are not afraid that something will happen because of the words that some of the somebody maybe says. So for us, I'm really I'm really happy to introduce today's first speaker. Today's first speaker will be talking about development model. His name is Andres Lundberg, and he will have a, he has a discussion with our development director Kale Valjaho about the Swedish Federation countrywide development model and changes that they did in the last few years, as well as their approach on the youth development and the structure of the youth development. He will show us the best examples from fin from Sweden on their development program and what their their values are. I am really happy that Andres and Kale were able to record this uh, video a few weeks ago and we will, we will show you the video and then after that we will have a discussion about it. So please enjoy, enjoy the presentation and you can use the people in the Zoom, you can use the question and answer tool as well to ask questions that we can later on discuss. So now we will watch the recording.
Welcome everybody for IHF Skills for All. Uh, today actually we're going to talk about the player development and we have uh, Anders Lundberg, director of national teams from Sweden in our guest. And it's going to open up a bit of the, how the Swedish model and how, how's the philosophy behind it. And as we have known, a lot of great Swedish players in, in worldwide, NHL, in Europe, Swedish success with different national teams, having those big numbers, and also successful sport in Sweden. So welcome, Andres, to IHF Studio. Thank you. Um, great to be here and uh, fun to talk about uh, a subject that I are really are engaged in, player development. Uh, I think that's uh, what, we, what we try to do uh, all around the world, and we have our own own different ways how we do it uh, so today I, I would try to explain how we our thoughts in in Swedish hockey perfect and again as I said he's going to explain what is the Swedish model what is the philosophy behind it I think there will be some fascinating ideas or kind of things that you're able to reflect how what you can bring it home idea is not to copy everything because again there's a culture plays a role and the environment plays a role but today we're going to listen about the Sweden and hopefully you will get some takeaways from the presentation so please Anders you may present thank you uh, and first uh, just gonna shortly introduce myself uh, Anders Lundberg uh, like uh, Kalle said, I've been working for the Swedish Ice Hockey Association since uh, 2013. Uh, started working uh, as a regional manager, um, work helping youth coaches out in the clubs, uh, coaching them and helping them to to develop themselves in their leadership and in their coaching style. Um, after that, I started working with our coaches' education program. I was the manager for that uh, for four years. Uh, it was also really exciting because you meet so many people. Uh, even though we have kind of the same curriculum in every single course, but no course is the same. Because there are different people with different uh, backgrounds and different ideas and everything. So. That, that was something that I, I really enjoyed uh, working with. Uh, after that, I started working with more with uh, player and uh, coaching development, uh, working with all of our um, national camps uh, from uh, under 15 up to the under 20 level, uh, how we progress uh, the players in, uh, in our national team structure. Uh, from that, I, I was the director of player development, um, and then the last year I've been the director of our national teams, which includes uh, the general manager for all of our national teams uh, this year. So, just a short uh, w version of what I've been doing for the federation so far. That's already an impressive year, you know, over 10 years with the development and think about the system and structure over here and with many roles I think that's also one really exciting thing that not just being a one role and as you said meeting a lot of people it's like a skill development always the situation is unique or in the game so being always different people and different situations and different companies so I'm really interested to hear how the how the Swedish system will be yeah and I, I think that's one of the the main things uh, for Swedish hockey is that it's it's about the persons. It's about human beings playing hockey. It's not just hockey players. It's persons who loves to play the game of hockey. And and I think that's really important that we don't see them as like an object, as a player. That we see them as human beings, and we treat them as human beings. I think that's one key part to. Uh, as a coach, really develop your players. Uh, so, <clears throat> what we try to do, we, we uh, did a pretty big work a couple of years ago when uh, we created a new development model for us. Uh, we call it the uh, translating into English now, but the home field model uh, should be recognized like playing on home field. 
and the advantages. You feel secure at home, uh, you know the environment, you know the people, you, you, you're kind of relaxed when you, when you are at practice. And I think if you are relaxed and you feel secure, you are willing to take more chances and, and risks to develop. You don't just do the things that someone tells you to do, that you, you actually uh, feel secure enough to, to improve yourself. Uh, so security and, and those kind of stuff in our home field model is, is uh, important. And the model is based on four principles. It's not like a, a curriculum, this is how you're going to do it. But we have four, four principles that we, we try to uh, get the coaches to really adapt in their coaching. Uh, and the first, uh, first one is uh, this like I said in the beginning, the person-centered approach. Make sure that you, you see the, this little kid first before you look at the hockey-specific parts. Uh, the other uh, principles is to make sure you give everyone a chance to develop. If, even though if you have like a big gap between the best and the, the player who is more far behind, you have no idea which one is going to be at the top level in the end. So, so you're saying that basically even though Anders has been playing 10 years of ice hockey and Kalle is coming in as a rookie, we are able to skate in the same sheet and we are able to practice with the same team or playing maybe in the same game too? Absolutely, 100%. You can, can play in the same game because I think you, you develop different kind of, kind of uh, attributes if you're the number one player or if you are really struggling. But you can still compete on the same ice surface. I think you can, as a coach, uh, in different drills, it's quite easy to, to make sure that you, you get, if you play, for instance, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you don't put your top player against the one who's most far behind. You try to put them together, but they are still in the same surface, they are still in the same team, uh, they get the team spirit together, uh, so for sure, even though if someone is in behind in under 11, under 12, or under 14 as well, don't just push them out, make sure that you give them a chance to develop as well, uh, that's really important for us. Uh, other um, guiding principles uh, is the appropriate settings in games and practice. Because an eight-year-old kid or a 12-year-old kid isn't a young adult. He's a kid. And playing, for us, playing full ice hockey in those age groups doesn't make any sense. Uh, what happens when we play full ice hockey in youth is if someone is quite big or quite good at skating, he takes the puck or she takes the puck, goes with it by themselves and they don't play the game. And we want them to play the game. So we have uh, played in much smaller, the small area games, even in the competition side, not just in practices that we, we have small area games uh, that the teams compete against each other as well. Okay, that's already making a lot of sense because you know, think about watching now world championships with the senior level, high speed, not too much space. And as you said, it like you know, maybe if we put the youth players to play in that same field size, there's, there's I think there's a lot of space. And even though you have five on five or six on six, it depends how do you count the numbers of players, but then I guess they're just. A lot of extra space involved in that game. Yeah, and if if you look at the <coughs> the World Championship that just ended, if uh, if one team is in the offensive zone, you have all the ten players in like half of the the offensive zone or the defensive zone for the <laughs> defensive part. But uh, so you have it's so tight the the game today and. F then why should we play in this big surface when they are kids uh, instead of making them get used to 
that it's it's tight. It's uh, I don't have much time. I need to make quick decisions. I, I need to take control of the puck really quick t to pass it along or take the shot or whatever I'm going to do. So um, I think that's... Uh, uh, like you said, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to play on the full ice surface, for sure. And the last <coughs> guiding principles that we have in our model is the fundamental movement skills. Not just hockey-specific training, that we actually make sure that they, they are athletes. Uh, as, as kids, and when they build their, building their body, uh, we can't just uh, do everything hockey specific. I think it, it increases uh, the risk of injuries. Uh, I don't think you get. Uh, I don't think you you are able to reach your absolute top if you don't get this bigger, broader. Um, movement skills from the beginning the the smaller you get i mean the top isn't gonna gonna go as high as as it could be in my opinion yeah exactly like if you think about all the positions players need to be in a game situation you might think that it's always some sort of stable 90 angles so you head up yeah puck over there but then you have the opponent and you might go in a really I don't know, would the word weird would, would, would be the best solution over there, but it could be like kind of like really you need to solve this problem and then yeah. think about you have to do some maybe other fundamental movement skill solution to actually figure it out how to win the situation. Yeah, exactly. And also I think you, if I combine that with the, the small area games and I, when we play on the smaller surface, I think it's also... Um, that's player safety uh, for me uh, because I mean if you don't have your head up and you you see what's around you uh, you can get hit uh, and we know that and we have concussions in ice hockey we don't want it we're trying to do our best to to go make it go to zero uh, but I think the better the players are to like use their cognitive skills and and be aware of what uh, goes around around them. Uh, uh, I think you have a much better spot to to stay safe on the ice as well. Even though that you play the game or you can go in and compete real hard and and uh, battling and all those kind of stuff. But as long as you're aware of what what's happening around you, and that's also one thing I like playing multiple sports uh, as a young kid I think that's really beneficial for for uh, game sense uh, and uh, and uh, understanding uh, everything around you in a better way and some sports are slower than hockey hockey is a fast game and I think that's also one part that you can um, use in a positive way that you understand like the principles of playing a game in a in a lower pace than skating on the ice as well. So not just listening to you and think about the fundamental movement skills and using other sports. So just just come to my mind a question like now we're talking about ice hockey development model. Do you do those things off ice when the kids are coming to practice? Do you? the coach run let's say football practice or football game or you do that kind of exercises or are you more messaging them to do it at their own time or how does it work uh, <coughs> both ways uh, uh, in in Sweden we we try to encourage kids to play multiple sports uh, so in the summer if they play soccer or go to athletics or whatever uh, but try to play multiple sports for us uh, we really encourage that but we also know that some kids they don't want to play multiple sports they just want to play hockey and for those kids it's really important that we 
as coaches still make sure that they get the fundamental movement skills so um, and that could be playing different uh, games like soccer or basketball or but it could also be um, I mean off ice training uh, strength and conditioning and uh, movements uh, all kind of stuff uh, but I think if if those kids who want to and have the opportunity to play multiple sports they have a huge advantage because uh, they get get it kind of for free when they do other things than playing hockey uh, but for sure we we need to make sure that those kids who who doesn't play multiple sports that we give them the, the chance to develop their fundamental movement skills anyway so that that's our thoughts on it um, and then uh, <coughs> like I said with the with the small area games um, when we are doing our recruitment uh, that starts from under six and uh, the biggest recruitment is from under six up to under nine in in Sweden. We we try to recruit later as well, but uh, we've seen that it, it's much harder to get kids in later. Uh, but from under six and up to under nine years old, and when we play games in those years, we play one sixth of the ice, uh, so just half of one end zone is the game surface for those age groups because and we play three on three and we have our we have our own rule book for these games and uh, what we've seen is the activity with the kids much higher uh, they have more fun and I think fun is kind of the most important thing if we want them to continue playing um, and uh, we also see the number of I mean, I know you also done studies about it, Kalle, but USA Hockey has done studies about it, and the number of puck touches, passes, shots, uh, goalie who makes more saves and everything, it's more of everything. And uh, for us, we've seen that this uh, one six of the eyes in this age group is really working well for us. That's for sure, and you said a lot of multiple touches, and there's a lot of studies out there. And then think about if there's a one six of the ICU, so you're able to set, I don't know, four, five, six games at the same time, or even more so, not just five on five, and only ten players are playing, I, I assume. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. We, we play at least uh, four games uh, on one ice surface, at least. Uh, it could be five or six as well, but... Uh, I know um, some coaches uh, they they want to have some areas between the the games and so on. So, but at least four four games in the same time, uh, and uh, just count six on each game for four games. So you have 24 players on the ice and really competing. Uh, some games maybe have goalies. Some games. Maybe don't have goalies. We don't care, but we play the game <laughs> anyway. Uh, so we use smaller nets uh, if we don't have goalkeepers. Uh, but the most important thing is that the kids they play, they play the game. Um, so that's what we we try to do. And then when we go, as the kids grow older, when when uh, uh, under ten, under eleven, then we play one fourth of the ice cross ice. So it's not the whole end zone, but one fourth of the ice. So it's still a little tighter, a uh, little smaller area. Uh, and then up to under 12, we play one third of the ice. So in, in Sweden now, we don't, go, we don't play full, full ice hockey until under 13 level. So there's a progression going under six, under nine, when you recruit, you get most of your players and then you go one six, one fourth, one third, and under thirteen, five on five, full ice. Yeah. How it it was started a few years ago. How's the feedback from the players, coaches, clubs, parents? Um, when we started, a lot of people were <laughs> a 
pretty mad or mm. upset at least because uh, what they they said they wanted to play real hockey uh, but what we did was uh, we did all our our studies behind uh, to to prove that this is a much better way to develop uh, as a player and uh, even though <laughs> we, ha we had our uh, meetings with uh, coaches and uh, clubs and almost everyone who uh, we we stood stood by and and we really wanted this to to um, to work and uh, now after a couple of years I, I think most of it of the nagging is is gone uh, what, what, we, what we didn't see when we started was uh, how to manage the game. Uh, that was something that, well, for us, just let them play and that's it. But it, it's not that easy. So we, after like a half, first half year, we, we made a, like a manual how to manage the games and set everything up and you know those all those practical things that com comes around when we play games so basically some sort of manual for the parents and adults to how to manage the game and but, but I guess the kids were okay to play yeah, one hundred percent correct. <laughs> the kids, uh, and of course, from from the beginning, they they also. I mean, when they look at their uh, role models, uh, they they want to play like they are. But as soon as they start playing, and when they when they try the full ice five on five, and then go on this smaller surface, this is what they want to do. This is much more fun for them, and everyone gets involved in the game. Everyone has the puck. Everyone gets the chance to score or or defend or save as a goalie. So uh, the kids, they they love this, and also from what what we've seen is that I mean the kids who starts playing hockey now, they have never seen the full ice. I mean, they start with the small ice now, so they have never experienced playing full ice hockey. So for them, it's just, okay, this is how we play hockey. So it, it, it's not a question anymore. So how do you, or do you somehow analyze, monitor, or, you know, that somehow feel, okay, how does it working? Because, you know, you're doing something different that used to be done. There's a reason why you are doing, but how do you, how do you evaluate your system? <coughs> Um, that, that's the tricky part because it takes time uh, to know that we have actually improved. Uh, we started like three years ago and uh, I think if we really want to see how good the players develop, we will need to wait like 10 more years until there are senior players and to see, uh, okay, how good are these players? compared to the one who didn't play the small area games. Uh, but what we do <coughs> is that we, we measure uh, players. We, we use tracking systems uh, in different areas in Sweden. Not every single game, of course, but we, we try to measure and, and uh, have some kind of markers that we to make sure that this it it looks okay, <laughs> it's, uh, to say. But um, but what what we've seen also with the game is that playing the small area games it doesn't also it's much easier to start a team because if you play three on three uh, you don't need much more than seven or eight players. So in Sweden, with our really small clubs, that maybe even they don't even have teams in every age group, or not even in the t two age groups. All of a sudden, they can have their own team. They don't need to 
to cooperate with another club. They can have their own team in, the, in their own club. And that, when, when they play in their own club and they have their own team, all of a sudden their, their buddies see that, oh, we have our own team here. And uh, so we see that the number of players are increasing. Uh, in Sweden after this and the more players the higher I think the higher quality it will be in the end as well so that's also one factor for us that we're measuring and that's uh, how many players do we have <laughs> yeah I guess that's the easy way to measure like if you're able to increase the number of players by doing this kind of like changes and uh, making sure that everybody are able to play I yeah. think that's a really good measurement and even though Sweden is one of the biggest hockey countries in the world, but if you are saying that you would like to get more players, I think that everybody should put the effort to get more players then. Yeah, and I, I think also that's, you can never take it for granted. Uh, even though we are one of the bigger hockey nations, but we still, we have, we have less than 70,000 players. Uh, we are, if we compare us to soccer in Sweden, they are like, I don't know, triple or four times as big as ice hockey. Uh, so we never take it for granted. And I think recruitment and, and working with retaining players, that's, that's the number one and number two thing that you, you will always need to, to uh, focus on. Because if if you don't recruit, you don't have players. If everyone quits or drop outs, you still don't have players. And then it doesn't matter if you're really good as a coach. You still need the players with you <laughs> during during the entire time. So um, recruitment and retaining is is uh, one of our main topics. Every single year we talk about how can we recruit, how can we retain, what do we need to do. Um, so, uh, and our <coughs> when we talk about recruitment, we have a concept uh, that we run from the association that the clubs can uh, use as uh, help. Uh, it's a concept that uh, with the three crowns, uh, so we call it the Trekronos Hockey School, Three Crowns Hockey School, um, where. Every club they get uh, jerseys, national team jerseys uh, in different colors. Uh, we help them with um, like a digital toolbox that they can use. Uh, they have um, posters. Uh, we have made a movie, a small clip that hey, you want to try to play hockey that they can use in their own uh, marketing with the clubs. Uh, we also have. Um, um, like invitation letter, uh, we have a system that uh, the club who, who wants to uh, can uh, apply and uh, then if they do, a letter goes out to every single kid five to seven years old in that region where the club is is uh, having their <laughs> their uh, rink. Yeah, exactly. So um, and we see that every single year we we have now up to 1,200 girls every single year who starts playing hockey. And um, on the boys' side, we have uh, around six, six and a half thousand every single year. So every year you said 1,200 girls start to play ice hockey and 6,000-ish boys. Are you happy with the numbers? Yes, we, I I am happy, but I'm I'm not uh, satisfied because <laughs> uh, we have uh, we are increasing, and uh, especially on the on the girl side, we have uh, just I would say six or seven years ago, it was maybe like two hundred girls who started playing, and now we're twelve hundred. Um, we still have have a big dropout uh, in the early ages, um, but. At least we, we get more kids to come and try to to try uh, to play hockey, and I think that's the start. And uh, uh, if we also do our work and make sure that it's fun for the kids, and hopefully we can retain even more more of them. So, but.
but yeah, I'm happy with the numbers. <laughs> uh, and uh, talking about, we have a pretty big dropout. Um, uh, retaining uh, as a youth coach, I, I think a question you should ask yourself is when when I meet this kid in 20 years, what do I want him to say about me do, or do think about me? Um, is it more important that I win when we go to play a small tournament at under 11 or in a way where I put players on the bench, I don't play everyone, but we win the trophy? Or should I make sure that every single kid in the game are having fun and they feel engaged and they are a part of the team fully? Uh, I think as a youth coach, you have a really big responsibility to to uh, not put your own dreams of winning tournaments coming before taking care of the kids who loves to play ice hockey. Um, does it make sense? It certainly does because we just had a, one discussion with one of the coaches and he still remembers his first youth coach when he was a player. And I guess it plays a really big role like you know when you start to play who, who, what kind of person there is taking you and coaching you and working with or not uh, not working with you I would say you no know, youth coaching would be like you know that guiding you helping you and making sure that you're in the right, right environment so makes a big role and because sometimes we have teams that we are really looking for the trophy we are looking for the gold medal maybe that's the outcome of, of building that positive environment yeah and with that said, what I don't say is that we're not going to try to win the games that we play. Of course we're going to try to win the games from the youngest ages. Uh, but how do we compete in the games? Uh, one thing is that, I mean, every single kid, try your best. Always encourage the kids to try their best. Every single time when they're on the ice, even if it's a practice or if it's a game, try your best all the time. But manipulate the game. Because as a coach, you can manipulate the game. And at the top level, at the senior level, at the world championship level, that's fine. That You, you should do you should do it, otherwise you're not doing your job as a coach. But being a youth coach, that's a totally different thing. That's when you're really going to work with development and make sure that the kids are having fun, are trying their best and uh, always encouraging them to do that instead of putting them on the bench and say, hey, you're not good enough. Who, who will develop from that? Yeah, I guess it all comes down who's on the ice. You know who's playing? Is the coach playing on the bench, or the, or does he or she let the players play on the ice? Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's also, I think, when when in our system we we start quite late with uh, selections. Uh, we have a, a district tournament uh, in the under sixteen level. Uh, we had 22 districts in Sweden, uh, so they pick out teams in each district. Uh, this tournament is broadcasted in public service, public television. Um, that's kind of the first really selection part in our system. Uh, that isn't... Otherwise, they play in the clubs, uh, they compete in their teams, but from the association and national teams and everything, we don't have anything before that tournament. So you say that, yeah, so the federation starts when they are under 16, 
but what about the clubs? I, I guess you had the tryouts and you know that's something that you cut the teams and very very early and the clubs might be selecting players quite early or how does it work? Uh, it, it's different uh, in the country. Um, of course, some clubs are are having, um, I would say, from the under 15 year tryouts, uh, but not earlier than the under 15. Th- those are the one who is really early in Sweden. They have tryouts from under 15. So under 15, first time that you kind of like put the players in some level in the club system. Yeah, we don't have like triple A hockey or double A hockey or that in at least I think the first the first um uh, uh year that we have like different levels is is the under 15 year uh in most part of Sweden. There it is a little different in different parts of Sweden, but most most part of Sweden it's the under 15 year that we go with like triple A or double A or but before that we we don't do it uh then of course it could still be uh players kids who who moves from one club to another it, and it could be hundreds of reasons uh, the family is moving or uh, they don't feel that good in this club or with this coach and that that's hockey that that's part of everything you you don't get along with everyone uh, but what we really try to do is to get the players to stay in their home club where they start to play and we try to help those clubs especially the smaller clubs to have such a good environment such a good development uh, that they don't need to move to develop if they move, it's because maybe their parents are moving and get a new job in other cities or whatever. But they should never have to move because they don't develop in their own home club. That's our goal. We're not completely there yet, but that's our goal. That's a fascinating goal. So, because people are attempt to having some type of, I don't know, it's a hurry the right wording, but somehow like them to like admit to identify who are the po- most potential kids early on because then we are, could we could invest for those those players. But I now I'm listing your model. So basically you let everybody play, you don't have any teams created according to development, just make sure that everybody are playing with the friends. It doesn't matter if Carla just started or Anders played for 10 years that you're a- able to play in the same team too. And and when you are 15, 16, there might be then about some leagues according to your playing level. Yeah, that's when when it gets more like different, different styles. Um, when 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 the players when they go to to the junior level uh we have our school system like high school hockey programs uh we have um 27 on the boys side that we have like our elite schools and we have six of them on the female side um and for sure when 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 uh, to get in in those school programs uh that's uh that's something that um you need to be really good <laughs> to to get in there because uh, we have i think it's on the boys side we have 370 spots and we have around three and a half thousand players each year so it's one out of ten who gets to join these programs but what we did with with that cuz still uh even though if you're not that good when you start high school you can still be the one who reaches the top if you uh, if you really are are like going for it um so we have other school 
programs as well, but they are not, they don't have the elite license from the association, but you can still play hockey uh, with the, with the, the school program uh, almost every single player in Sweden can, if they want to. Um, <clears throat> but when we start with, uh, with uh, the recruitment for, for the elite um, high school programs, uh, the clubs are doing the recruitment by themselves. Uh, they have a couple of uh, rules that they need to follow. They can't make contact with the player too early and uh, they have a window when they, when they can um, recruit the players. Uh, but what is really important for the clubs is to what are they looking for? Uh, what they see on the ice is the skill that the player have now. And then they try to predict, okay, which player will be the best in the future? Kind of like the NHL draft. Uh, it's the same, same thing. Um, but the skill at the moment there are so many things that are um, depending on w why they look the way they do now. It could be how how many how much time have they invested in in the sport? Have they done other sports? Um, that could be a good thing to predict the future, but maybe it's a little bad right now because they don't have as much ice time uh, or stick handling as other players so they maybe don't have all those skills but maybe they have a higher potential I don't know but those are things you need to consider uh, the social context how much support have the kids from from home uh, the biological age chronological age uh, level of ambition, how serious is the players. But the only thing we see is, okay, this is what the kid can do out on the ice. But there are so many different things that that um, will uh, affect on how good the players will be. And that's why we, we say that, and why we don't have the, the structure when we, when we put them in different levels early because we don't know who's going to be the best. Uh, I, when, I, when I hear a, a parent who has a 13-year-old son, it's mostly with, with boys, these parents, uh, this kid is going to make it to an NHL. He's the, so good. He, he can do everything. He's amazing. And I say, are you sure he will, will go to NHL? Yes, I'm sure. I always ask them, why, why aren't you an NHL scout? Because you know something that no one else does. Because the scouts, they follow the players. They're under 16 year, under 17 year, and under 18 year. And they have like half of the first rounds are actually the one who plays for real and have a long NHL career. Half of the first rounds. So... We don't know who's going to be the top player. Of course, a lot of the players that will go to the NHL, they are good when they are 16. But not everyone is at the top level when they are 16. Uh, Swedish player Jon Klingberg uh, had a tremendous uh, career uh, with the World Championship gold for Sweden and played the Stanley Cup final. Uh, he almost didn't make the cut to to the high school program. He was the last player in in that that program. Uh, but he, he's the best player from that from that year now. So that's why it's so important that you don't like judge kids players too early. Always work with the development. Work with the development. And then when they are 25, 26, then we can see, okay, how good were they? That sounds great to have a, give time for players that they're able to 
play the game, maybe find out their potential, and there's no structural system that tells you that, hey, that sorry, you're not good enough. So I guess if you're able to, if you want to have a big talent pool, you need to have a lot of, lot of players in the pool and make sure that everybody are treated at least same way and getting practice. So sounds logical. Yeah, and then, uh, I mean, most of the players, they won't make it to the NHL or, or the national team. Or, most of them don't. It's just a few <laughs> who reaches that level, and we need to be be uh, fair. Of course, we we want to encourage the the players to follow their dreams, but we, still, it's just a few of them who reaches NHL. Uh, that that's the fact, I think. But uh, that's when we work with the players also. I, I told about uh, the district tournament, the uh, Teve Pukken, that we call it. Um, a lot of kids in Sweden, they are really, that's like a big goal to, to be part of, of that tournament. And the other goal is to get into the high school system. Uh, then the youth national teams, the NHL draft, playing the World Juniors. But those steps, they can't be the end goal. Because when you play World Juniors, you're still under 20. That's So a lot of people are such in a hurry to be good at, a, at an early age. But it's not about who's best at under 12 or under 13 or under 17 or even under 20. A lot, most people in the World Juniors, they don't reach NHL either. Uh, but how do we get the players to reach for the, the correct finish line? And the, the finish line, that's, that is when they quit playing. And the, the only thing that is 100% the same for every player who plays in the NHL, do you know what that is? No, I don't know. They haven't quit playing. That's the only thing that is 100% the same with everyone. They haven't pl quit playing. They have all trained hard, but I don't think they train exactly as much. Uh, they all have some kind of, I think, uh, skill <laughs> for sure, <laughs> but they have different skills. Uh, the only thing is 100% the same, is that they haven't quit. That, that's um, my 100% uh, certainty that that's the case. And that's why it's so important that we work with retaining players, because that's when we can develop them. Uh, if we don't have them in the, in the game, we can't develop them. And we don't get the top players, and we don't get the players who just loves to play the game. Uh, as a 27-year-old or a 35-year-old or 48-year-old just loves to play the game. I think it would, we really need to get p people to that they want to stay in the game of hockey one way or another. If they play the game, or if they coach the game, or if they referee the game, or being a parent or sponsor, but we we should create the environment where every person would like to be a part of. That, I think that's when we have real success. And I am 100% sure that it would also affect our top level program as well, if we would be able to do, to do that. That sounds fascinating, and it sounds also logical if you think about that for the athletes, what is the right finish lane. But even though when you quit playing, there's life after playing career. You know, coach, team manager, national team director, equipment manager, sponsor, fan. So kind of like having a hockey for life. Attitude, so yeah, that that's spot on. Uh, hockey, hockey for life. That's that's what 
what we're really trying to do and and uh, then we know that hockey isn't for every single one but i think we always need to try our best to to make it uh, for everyone and not exclude anyone uh, it doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl or or um, if you're 15 year old or 6 year old or 37 year old just be part of it we we want the hockey family to grow and we want everyone to be involved and uh, that's that's what we're trying to do just listening these getting these numbers when you get early age you get a lot of players involved you try to keep them close to home 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 club model in a way you don't cut people out you try to keep everybody involved you're able to come in later too and you know making sure that you're able to play with your friends and actually you're you're able to play so there's no no maybe not not sitting on the bench and eating the crib it's just more about you know jump on the ice and and learn learn from there so it would be really interesting to see how Swedish hockey will develop again with this. Now have the change with the small array game that it, just, it wasn't used to be, and it will be really interesting to follow like how things are going. So thanks for this today's presentation. Thank you, and uh, I'm also really curious to see <laughs> where where this is going. But uh, uh, we're, we're trying to to do good things, and I. I know it, a lot of. I mean, if if we when we talk to to the Finnish Ice Hockey Association or USA Hockey or, I mean, everyone is pretty similar in in the way they think, and then I, I think the the culture is uh, um, how how we set everything up. That's the bigger difference. But I, I think in the end, what what everyone wants is that uh, hockey is for life, uh, like the end. Exactly. So I just going to finish this presentation about thinking about my takeaways from Anders presentation would be like, there's never too many players in your program. So you're able to get everybody involved. You try to keep them as as long as possible. Make sure that you don't spend your time on traveling in the car. And give a chance to everybody to reach their full potential. So these are my takeaways. And if, if Sweden is able to do it, I think every every country, every nation from the IHF family are able to do it. So thank you very much, Anders. Thank you for your time. And good luck with the development programs. Hello everybody again. Thank you Andres and Kalle for a wonderful presentation and for showing us the changes and development that they did in Sweden. For me it was really interesting to see that they are happy with the numbers but they are never satisfied and if we think about the size of Sweden that's really interesting. And thinking about what uh, what what uh, Sweden did with development, IHF is trying to help all the federations to have a federation developer, so person in charge of development in the federation. And coming to that topic, today we have with us Jorma Makipa, who is in charge of a sport association and club development specialist for Viermaki uh, Sport Institute of Finland. And IHF and Viermaki are together working on a, on a M&A developer program that is according to our strategy, ICE 26, one of the most important initiatives to help federations build their development plans and run their programs effectively. So, so the, the main purpose of this program is for people overseeing development in their federation to get different knowledges and different ideas and get educated on how to do it well. So, Jorma, thank you for joining us today. Uh, hope you can hear me. Yes. Awesome. So I I would leave floor to you and looking forward to your presentation as well. Okay. Thank you, Marco. And just to make sure that you all can see the screen. 
Perfect. Good. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the beginning of it. I think it really sums it up how this program is uh, planned to be. And I will take about 12 minutes and 12 slides to try to, uh, in brief, come together and explain what this m &A Developer Program is about. As Marco mentioned, uh, this is part of the ICE 26 IHF strategy initiative. And here is the, here are a few original ideas. What was this uh, education course meant to be? Idea is to have a one year education from May 23 to May 24. Uh, and initially we tried to reach people who oversee the development in their MNAs. In this presentation, you will see what the outcome is and uh, how the pilot year has gone. As part of IHF support for this, they cover all the costs for the education, room and, and board. And for this year, the participants only have to pay for the flights to the uh, on two on-site weeks that we have. So for the pilot year, we received more than we expected. Uh, 70 people were accepted for the program in the beginning, representing 49 different countries. Uh, as we are approaching the halfway line, we have 48 people uh, with us, uh, still with a good number of 40 different countries represented. Sometimes people have dropped off as for personal reasons, or for organizational reasons that there has not been ability to uh, participate in the mandatory online on-site weeks or just to keep up with the assignments that we have uh, and the development work that they're doing in their MNAs. The 48 people that we have here is a general overview and uh, just to give you understanding of the people who we have with us this year. The ice hockey experience of our MA developers for this cycle uh, go from one year to 45 years. So we have people who have really been operating with ice hockey for a long time, and some people are quite new to it. Then for, we asked how long have, you, have these participants been part of the MA or this role that they are in? And again, we have from uh, people who are really new to their position to somebody who's been in that role or in the MA for over two decades. The positions that we have in the group range from uh, MA presidents to CEOs, sport directors who are considered to be on the higher end or top level on the planning side. And also, we go to uh, learn to play instructors or coordinators. Uh, coach, coaches, coach educators, or girls and women's uh, hockey coordinators. So we have a big spectrum from uh, the operational side to the management and leadership side, but also uh, from zero years or one year of experience in ice hockey or this position to decades of experience. So this in mind, it challenges the original idea of having people who oversee the development in the MA. But for the pilot year, we see this as an opportunity because this way we can see a more uh, holistic and more coverage on the MAs and the different positions, different roles, what are the needs and uh, situations in the MAs. Also for the participants, it gives a good understanding of what does the leadership do or what is expected of them, but also on the operational side, what is happening, what is uh, needed uh, skill-wise or resource-wise to get people involved or to organize events. So this is a good chance for us to get a really big view of different MNAs, uh, different size MNAs uh, during the year. So this is an opportunity for us that uh, we have a range of people with us. 
this picture is a representation of our year uh, and the red circle is the beginning for us and the year consists of seven webinars uh, the pace is about once a month and in between each uh, webinar we have some gray arrows those represent home team meetings uh, we encourage all the participants to create a home team or a group in their M&As that they can take the topics, take the assignments uh, for sharing, but also for uh, questioning, uh, shared learning, uh, so that they can the participants can be supported by the M&A, but also the M&A can be challenged uh, in the way uh, that they may have never been challenged before. But how do we react to these assignments or analysis? Or what is the situation? How do we communicate internally in the MNAs? These three circles and the hockey pucks represent, we call them away teams, which are uh, small group meetings organized by the participants themselves. The topics for these meetings rise from the participants and they can report the outcome in their own way. And this is one way we encourage uh, meeting outside the webinars, meeting outside the on-site weeks to upkeep the network of people we have learned to know, to get to know each other better and to support each other as we have realized that we have a range of experience and range of skills that are within this group. So we encourage uh, these non-formal uh, ways of meeting as well throughout the year. During the year, we have two uh, gatherings or get-togethers for the pilot year. During the summer of 23, we had about 22 people in Finland for a week at Vierumäki. In Uzbekistan, in Tashkent, we had uh, 14 participants and in Korea we had 12 participants and the participants were divided to each location uh, mainly geographically uh, a little bit on the time zones which are close to each location but also if there was challenges with that people were able to move around a little bit uh, to a location that fits them but this uh, on-site week on the top right hand corner is mandatory for the participants to uh, to join. And our second get together, it will be at the end of the process in Chechia, uh, right around the World Championships, where we all come together as 48 MA developers. Each developer has selected a development program or a project for them to carry on with them throughout the year. These projects are also supported and shared amongst each other. And we hope that uh, the projects rise from the planning of the MA and are, are really connected to the work that the developers are doing. And in the end of the year, we all get to see some concrete uh, examples of how each project has evolved throughout the year and this way we can also ensure that something concrete is improving in the MA throughout the course and here is just a short recap of the three sections of our year so the beginning part beginning third is to get to know each other uh, introduce the program in the couple of first webinars introduce the planning the strategic thinking uh, that is needed to understand the big picture we have the on-site week when we really get to know each other better then now we are entering the fall season uh, where we expand our thinking uh, during the webinars and then after uh, christmas time and new year's we come to the spring with a couple webinars and start to close the year uh, and close the program to be ready for the jedgia second on-site week Just in brief, here are some of the 
topics that we have covered throughout the year. Uh, spine for the program or red line is strategic thinking and understanding a little bit of theory and practice about what it is to plan the MA uh, activities in a longer period of time. During the on site weeks, in addition to the strategic side, we also cover the topics of learn to play and pathways for players in each MA. We focus on leadership, and in leadership, we talk about personal development and personal growth, um, and also leadership within the MAs. We touch recruitment and event organization through group activities and creation of uh, new ideas and sharing of good practices. And we have uh, had a topic of coach development where we had the IHF coach development framework as a background information uh, to refer to. And then each m and can, can really look and see and how their own program and coach development can be improved. For the reminder of the uh, course, we still have a few topics to cover and uh, this is a learning process for us as well, that nothing is carved in stone and we react to what we hear from the participants, what topic is good, what could be done. So, but these are a few ideas that we have still coming up in our sleeve for the participants. This picture is a collection of uh, footage and, and slides from the course. And an idea that we have on the background is that we keep in mind the way people learn and also how adults learn. We are not a organization that relies on lectures. We don't run this course by lecturing to everybody, but we keep providing different opp opportunities to learning and we make the participants also think how they learn the best. But we try to keep things active, uh, people involved instead of only listening to some experts in the front of the classroom. As we had about learning environment in the previous presentation, we have the same approach that we would like to create an environment that is inspiring for learning and if you have a chance to talk to anybody who's part of the m a course uh, please uh, grab their sleeve and, and has ask their opinions how this has been but we hope to create an environment that is something that people want to join our big focus is on building relationships among the staff or the educators but also really between the participants. And as these two pillars uh, are functioning well, we feel that the learning will happen automatically uh, in a good direction. This picture is about learning as a team. We look to improve individuals through their personal development or personal growth plans but also the home teams, the group work that we do, the network that the participants are creating is really something that we hope to see that this is not about individuals. This is about us being part of the program and learning together. In the previous presentation, you heard the word hockey for life. We would like to say learning for life. So as long as the attitude of the participants is open, we are able to create trust among each other and we have a good direct communication with each other. We feel that this program can support lifelong, lifelong learning of all the participants. So then what is happening in the future? Uh, as mentioned earlier, 
this pilot year will end in May 2024. And the idea and the resources are such that this program is planned to be run every year with a bit different target group and, and theme. So if we go down to the season 23-24, our approach has been a bit more holistic, more bigger uh, picture about the MNAs and also the MNAs longer term and term planning is is one of the ideas that we would like to improve. In the season 2024 20, to 25, we look to have a more specific program with, for example, coaching program. Um, people around the world could join us. Uh, we have not yet to decide uh, if we have a specific topic or not, but people from specific areas would come together uh, for a program with us to improve that targeted area in their MA. So, how to learn more? And if this sparks an idea that this sounds like a good thing for you or for somebody you know, first thing could be to look into your own MA. If you have somebody in the program already, reach out ask from them how the, their experience has been, and then get in touch with your own MA or with us to, to learn more about the future opportunities. If there is nobody in your MA in the program yet, uh, and this is of interest, uh, please reach out to Kalle Valiao from in the IHF to learn more about the, the bigger or the longer term plan for the MA developer course. If you have questions about the current program, uh, I am happy to share our views and thoughts in addition in addition to our participants. So uh, please reach out to Kalle or myself and hopefully this gives you a brief idea of a new initiative initiative from my IHF how they want like to uh, upkeep and increase the communication with the MNAs and to support the long-term development of the MNAs. Uh, and I will be around for some discussion later on after this presentation. So thank you for the close to 12 minutes and, and Marco, all yours. Thank you, Jorma, for a great presentation. And I've took part of the m a developer as a, as an instructor as well as a participant, and it's a, I think it's a great tool and great resource for everybody involved to get help and learn new things to help their federations. Um, now the next part is uh, just a, as said we have as said we have already. We have people joining us through Zoom, and then we have people watching through the YouTube stream. And people who are on YouTube stream, after this part, we will be finishing the stream because after this we will have we will have a discussion, open discussion about the topic, and it, we will build relationship between each other in order to in order to get to know each other and get maybe some other ideas. As said on the beginning, you are more than welcome to join us via Zoom link. Everybody, it's open for everybody. It's open for public. We, there is no secrets. We want to have it openly, but we don't want to record it because maybe some people are afraid of of, of uh, things that we want to have it. Uh, open discussion so so next webinar will be on the 29th of uh, November and it will be about the global presence about recruitment and retention we will show some good examples of our MNAs what they are doing there and uh, combining with the IHF World Girls Ice Hockey Weekend as well as domestic development plans from the IHF initiatives and if, if you if, if, if you didn't receive a links for uh, this year, this season, this session, to your own personal account, you can send me an email. And I will add you to the to the email list, as well as there is a QR code that you can scan, and you can see on our IHF webpage the promotion and all the all the material concerning this year's Skills for All seminars. 
everybody on Zoom, please stay online. And everybody on YouTube, thank you for joining us and thank you for taking part of it. Now our IT.